First of all, let me say good afternoon to all of you who are here this afternoon. It is a privilege for me to be here, and I want to thank so many people. And I think we ought to thank this wonderful group. The uh, mother of the young lady said to me when I first came up this morning that my, my daughter's going to be doing something special before you speak. And so we saw what that was, and I think we ought to give them another round of applause. I thought I was going to do a five-side chat when I first said I needed a chair. And then when we practiced on Sunday, I discovered I could stand up the whole time. But I'd like to sort of have the chair just in case I decide to make it a fireside chat. I was born in Coconut Grove uh, back in December 17th of 1926 and lived all of my early childhood and early adult life right over on Charles Avenue at 3382 Charles Avenue in a house with two bedrooms and a hallway, kitchen, front porch, big yard, outside privy, no electricity, no running water. And I have some friends here could attest to that because we all came up in the grove together. And there's so many people out there that I, when I say I want to start at square one and show you how I reinvented my life over this 85 years and nine months that I've lived, and to have you know that it's just a beautiful thing to know the young people could learn some of the things that we went through back in the olden days. I have people ask me, Ms. Gibson, what was it like in the olden days? And I say, oh, you don't want to even want to know. Because we knew how to play. We knew how to jump rope and hopscotch and shoot marbles and have little card games and all that sort of thing coming up in Coconut Grove. And we walked down the street, we had to speak to everybody and say good morning on your way down and good afternoon on your way back. And some of the first things you learned was to say please and thank you. Because Coconut Grove was so full of fruit trees and, you know, we used to enjoy hurricanes, whether you all know it or not. When the hurricanes came, there was a lot of rain and wind. And after the hurricanes, you got all these, this fruit on the ground. You just walk down the street and you pick up fruit everywhere you go. But I came up at square one, going to Coconut Grove, elementary school for color, training school for color. And I went to elementary and junior high school at Coconut Grove Training School for color. And when I tell people I've lived a couple of lives, I like to tell this story about how I lived as a colored person. I was colored for so long, and then a Negro. And then finally in the 70s, we were colored and Negroes until the 70s, y'all. And in the 70s, they decided we were black, and black was beautiful, and I thought that was great. And I loved being black for those 10 years or so that we were black. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, they decided we were no longer black, but we were Afro-Americans. And I had this friend who said, but, but Thelma, Afro was a hairstyle. And why are they saying Afro? And finally, they decided we were African-Americans. And so during the 80s and 90s, we were African-Americans. And I always said, you know, it's just so good to be a good old American. I came from the Bahamian background. My grandfather came here back in 1887 and worked for the Monroes. And so when I came along, this was the old school for boys. And we used to come right? up here, some of the people, Adirondack, Florida School for Boys, for those of you who don't know that while you were here at Ransom Everglades today, back in the olden days, it was a, a school for boys. I've it. And it's just so wonderful to have lived this long to see all these changes that take place because as a child, we came down and Mr. Culmer and Mr. Smith, who worked here, Mr. Culmer had these three boys, and they would pick up some of us girls, and we'd come down here and be able to put our feet in the water because we couldn't go to the beach. You know, we didn't have no beach for colored or Negroes back in the day. And so we, uh, Virginia Beach didn't come until 1945, a time when uh, one Theodore Gibson came to town as an Episcopal priest and came to Christ Episcopal Church and was saying to people how his people were living in filth. Uh, and Ms. Virick, Elizabeth Virick heard him speak, and she said, Father, I want to help. And she came, and between the two of them, they started making change take place in Coconut Grove. So they went to the city commission and got the ordinance passed to put in running water. So we finally got running water going down our streets. Of course, Coconut Grove was a bustling place for us as children because there were a lot of businesses on Grand Avenue especially. We had um, Sarah Snyder's stop, and we had Izzy's place, and we had Toback's place, and we had so many mom and pop stores and beauty shops, and it was busy on Grand Avenue, and then a few of the corner pop and corner stores were mom and pop stores were on the corners. 
but it was a wonderful time growing in Coconut Grove. I finally lived long enough to have our school name changed after George Washington Carver. Dr. George Washington Carver died in 1943. We named this Coconut Grove Elementary School and Junior High for Colored to George Washington Senior High School, Junior Senior High. And I finished from there in 1944 and wanted to go to nursing school and wanted to go to Jackson Hospital. And I could go there because I was colored, still colored or Negro. So I ended up going to St. Agnes School of Nursing in Raleigh, North Carolina for a three-year program where I was a cadet nurse. We had the cadet corps because of the World War II, the government had started the Nurse Cadet Corps where they paid all of your expenses to go to nursing school, gave you $15 a month, and that was a lot of money there, young people, uh, $15 a month for the first two years. And when you became a senior, you got $30 a month. And they gave you six months of specialized training in any area that you wanted. And some of our classmates went to Meharry. I went to Meharry with our class, three of us. And some went to New York. Some went to Baltimore, to Johns Hopkins. And I went to Meharry for six months of specialized training in operating room technique. And I came back. I wrote to Jackson and said I had been trained in operating room and I wanted a job. And they sent me a letter giving me a job. And I got here. And I got to Jackson Hospital, and they took one look at me and said, uh, 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 Nurse Anderson, you can't work in the operating room, but if you work on the colored floors and get some experience, maybe one day you could work in the operating room. So I had to work. You know, I was the first in my family to go away to school. My oldest sister had finished and went to Detroit. My oldest brother had finished and had to go to the Army, so I was the next person. And so I was the first to go, and I had to come back and help. So I said, okay, I'll work in, on the colored floors. I worked on colored one and colored two, where you're medical and surgical floors, and stayed for two years. And I left, went to E.J. Hall's clinic downtown and worked for a year. And then I thought, oh, I'll go to Washington, D.C. That's going up north. So I write to Gallinger Municipal Hospital, which was the city hospital in, in the district. And I get up there, and it was the same story. Uh, 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 you can't work in the operating room. Well, they didn't want to tell me that the laws said that, you know, white colors can't work with whites and that sort of thing. So I stayed there for a year, came back to Jackson in 1951, and that's when they started the medical school there at Jackson Hospital. At that time, the nurses were helping to teach some of these students. Uh, it's always amazing when you see Dr. Greer because we laugh about this so often. I met him when he started with all these homeless programs, and we did stuff together at Jackson and uh, Veterans Hospital when it opened up just across the street from Jackson. And so we go back a long way, and so we were talking in the back before we came out, and he said, Thelma, I don't want you to speak in Spanish. I said, never mind. <laughs> never mind. But anyway, I couldn't work in the operating room, so I took some courses um, at Catholic University for a couple of summers. I uh, did some other kinds of things. In 1957, I decided I'd go to the University of Miami. So I applied at the University of Miami, and I get there, and they again take one look at me and say, uh, 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 if you get 12 students, we'll give you an instructor, and you could have these classes on the instructor's home. So they took English 101 from the University of Miami in 1957 and 1958. Then we had to go to Booker T. Washington High School to take 102, and by that time, I decided, okay, I had some land and ghouls in the school system, mind you, decided to take my land by eminent domain to build Ghouls Elementary. Mind you, I was doing public health nursing by that time and had worked down in Ghouls and bought some land, and they took it, and I decided, okay, I'll take this money. I finally got them to settle with me, and I bought some land across the street from the property they were buying, and I thought I'd go to New York. Uh, teach, uh, said, well, I'll go to Teachers College up at Columbia just to get a degree in nursing because I was an RN but didn't have the bachelor's degree. So I ended up going to Teachers College at Columbia and while there worked over in the Bronx with teenage drug addicts. And it was my first real experience in knowing what drug addiction could do to young people. And as I speak to you young people today, I want you to know that it's so important that you not get involved with drugs. Don't let your friends get you to get, you know, the first they started out with the marijuana and, and hiding 
to do that, and then they go into other drugs. But I had young people, teenagers, who drowned trying to abscond from that hospital because it was in the Bronx. I mean, Riverside Island was right down from Rikers Island. For you, those of you who know the Bronx or knew New York, Rikers Island was down, up, but we had to go across the boat to get to Riverside and to Rikers. And it was a wonderful experience working with those young people. But I came back to Miami, and of course, it's amazing. I didn't tell you earlier when I first finished my first payday, I paid $50 to have our house wired so that we got our first refrigerator. And then I got the house, I put, I bought a, you know, it's amazing. We didn't have uh, television back in those days. Uh, young people, you could never understand that we didn't get television until almost the 50s. But then I was born in 26, remember. So as I go through life seeing how you reinvent yourself, I decided I could do something a little bit different. And I got married. And I married this Episcopal priest who had come here. And uh, I had a different life altogether because he became involved in politics. And of course, I had no interest in politics. But when J.L. Plummer, who was the commissioner, who asked my late husband if he would uh, let him appoint him to the city commission, he said, well, you have to talk with my wife. And so J.L. came to see me. And I said, well, my husband's not a politician. He's a priest. And he said, no, he's a statesman, and he's, he's fighting for the rights of all people, and so we need him on the city commission. So I said, well, if, if you think he could do it, I, yeah, I see nothing wrong with that. So that gave us another new life, and I started meeting all these wonderful people out there. I saw some people today uh, outside that I hadn't seen in years and uh, remembered some of the things that had happened through the years, and it was just so wonderful. And I, I really want to thank... Uh, uh, the head, Ms. head of schools here, Ms. Mosseri, who was on the board of the school, uh, Gibson School, in the beginning. And she came, I came up here one day with her and saw all of the things that had happened here and all the growth here at uh, Ransom Everglades. And it was just a wonderful thing. I also need to thank Madison's parents and Madison and her parents for inviting me to be a part of this program, as well as the TEDx people who brought the program to us. And then to Dr. King, who has been trying to get us all together, to get our speeches together and to all this stuff. And I said, every time I talk, the speech is different. But in reinventing myself, I say to people all over that, you know, I go through this period where I was colored and then Negro and then finally black. And I thought black was beautiful. And then finally, again, I say African-American, where I like being just an American. But it's so wonderful to see some of the people who have gone through these things, because I live long enough, having not been able to work in the operating room at Jackson, to have been appointed to the Public Health Trust at Jackson Hospital back in 1984. Um, amazing that I couldn't go to the University of Miami on campus to school, and I, I say to young people, change takes place, and this is what we talk about with reinventing yourself and, and having going from square one all the way around. Now, the young people need to understand this, that you can keep on keeping on, and you have to be a dreamer. You have to dream about what it is you want out of life, and then be willing to go on and work toward getting, and getting to that point where you'll have that. And so, in 1997, I was called by my good friend Jay Weiss and Bob Weaver and uh, Jay Wy but a wiser who's now dead, and said, uh, we want you to come on board the University of Miami as a trustee. And I said, me? <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. I said, you don't want me. I don't have any money. And, <laughs> <laughs> and it, it, it was amazing. It was then that I met uh, the Miller family. Mr. Miller was, Leonard Miller Sr. was the uh, chairman of the board. And they said to me, oh, you've got to come. You've you got to be a part of this. And it's just, uh, I tell you, his widow was here today. I saw her outside earlier. But it's amazing that I went on board, and I'm still a trustee at the University of Miami, even though I couldn't go on campus to school there or able to be a trustee um, on the public health trust at Jackson, even though I couldn't work in the operating room there. I never saw an operating room again until I went in for surgery. But, uh, <laughs> But it, it just amazes you when you think of the things that you do to help society. When I met Dr. Greer, uh, and he was working with the homeless, we were getting involved with all these things. And my late husband died 20, 30 years ago. 
and we started the Gibson Memorial Fund. And with the Gibson Memorial Fund, we then started the uh, charter school tour. It started in Coconut Grove. It's now in Overtown. And uh, as I said earlier, Ms. Marcieri was on the first board of our uh, uh, charter school when we first started back in 2002. And uh, then we moved on. I have been able to work and start the Women's Chamber of Commerce uh, of Day County, which is still in existence. We started back in 1984. And when I started the Gibson Moral Fund, y'all, all I wanted to do was get an organ to put in Christ Episcopal Church. Elizabeth Virick and G.L. Plum and that bun sat there in my living room and said, you've got to be out of your mind. Nobody's going to give you money to buy an organ for Christ Episcopal Church. You, that our Gibson was about education. And so we've got to have an education facility in his memory. And so that's how the charter school came about. But in reinventing myself and getting involved in the community, as I say always, I've met so many wonderful people and so many things that happen to you in life and you feel like you've been blessed because of the wonderful things and the wonderful people. I ended up writing my life story, which is called But Forbearance, and uh, Dr. Helen McGuire, who helped publish that, is with us this afternoon. And, and we, we really had a wonderful time doing that book, and it's just about my life all of what I'm saying to you today is perhaps in that book, except there's so many names there in that first chapter because I had a large family and uh, all of their names, I tried to remember everybody. Then after I published, we were self-published and found out there were all these cousins that I didn't remember. And so <laughs> cousins came out of the woodwork and they're always saying to me, you gotta do it again. And like uh, one of the speakers earlier who said, it took him so long, uh, the lawyer who said it took him so long writing this book, it's not an easy job to try to write your life story. But I say to young people especially, it is so important that you keep a journal and you keep up with what's going on in your life so that when you do have to write this story, you will have something to give to the community. And I, I again want to thank all of you for being here because this is just a wonderful occasion for Miami because it's the first time the TEDx has come to this community. And I think all of you probably read in the paper they're going uh, to two other places uh, this year. And we're just so proud to have been a part of this whole uh, process of getting ready and preparing for this and to see young people so involved. Uh, I think Madison has worked herself <laughs> beyond recognition almost because she did a wonderful job. I think if you were here earlier and heard her with her presentation, it's just so wonderful to know that young people are continuing to start at square one, to be able to reinvent themselves and to be able to give back to a community especially communities who has given so much to all of us. And I think Miami is coming into its own. Uh, you know, we despair, but I always say it's so important to be able to forbear. And forbearance is what I want to leave with all of you this afternoon, is that you could reinvent yourself. You could start from square one and be able to get to that point that you feel like you've been reinvented and reach the goals that TEDx is trying to have us reach as we sit and go from place to place with this program. And again, I want to thank you for being a good audience.